My name is Luis Alvarado. I'm a director of learning design, part of the Office of Graduate and Professional Studies, working to support uh, School of Education, as well as some of our alt academic initiatives like lifelong learning micro-credentials, uh, and as well as some of our EOE quality initiatives. So there's a lot going on in our space, but I'm joined by my wonderful colleague that'll let her introduce herself as well. Hi, I'm Rachel Hudish. I'm also, uh, for, I'm a senior instructional designer under the OGPS uh, department, and I typically support the School of Education along with some of our micro-credential courses and some of the uh, ad hoc uh, projects that we end up uh, working on as a team. So I'm happy to be here and walk everybody through our presentation. All right, welcome, welcome. Thank you for joining us this morning, spending your morning with us. I hope you have your coffees ready. So what a great segue, Rachel, because we do work on quite a bit as a team. Uh, jack of all trades, if you will. We are strong and mighty team when it comes to online learning. And I did wanna just do a general introduction of our office, um, the Office of Digital Learning and Strategy sitting under another office, the office under another office, of graduate and professional studies. Uh, so you have some of our team members, maybe some of those faces are familiar, those names are familiar, you've gotten an email from them. Uh, we really make up a group of very talented instructional designers, we can be your thought partners in that, as well as multimedia experts. And so we're really trying to up the game in online learning capabilities here at American University. So really excited to present some of the tools that we have available. Some are free for you to use immediately, uh, and we don't have necessarily an enterprise license for, but really could be leveraged and utilized in different capacities and could be helpful for you. Um, if you couldn't tell from the beginning of the presentation, uh, you know, it really is all about authenticity, right? I, I liked telling Rachel this, but, you know, the greatest piece of technology within any classroom, like the most important component is the faculty member, right? How you come across, how you tell stories, um, how you communicate with your students. None of these technologies will ever be able to replicate that need for human connection, the social aspect of learning. That being said, one of my all-time favorite superheroes, I don't know if it's one of your favorite superheroes, is Batman. And I got to ask myself, because he is not, ooh, thank you, transcribe, let me click OK. He is. He really has no superpowers, right? He's wealthy, and he uses tools. He's wealthy, and he uses tools. So our tool belt, right? What we use and leverage at the right time, at the right, pl uh, right place and right time, can go a long way at increasing learning outcomes for our students. And I think Batman is such a great example of what is the what is possible, right? What is possible when we use those right tools at the right time as interventions, as moments of building community, as moments of engagement. You know, I, I have also taught classes at AU, and I know that sometimes, you know, especially in online synchronous sessions, oftentimes it can feel like you're not getting students buy-in from everyone. You know, you got some go-getters, but you're not getting everyone's attention, uh, or you're not knowing what they're thinking. And I think diversifying your tool set, right? Diversifying where students can connect with you, connect with the content can go a long way. So hopefully this serves as a, a, a teaser, uh, if you will, to connect with one of your designated instructional designers to potentially think and implement one of these tools within your face-to-face -face classroom, as well as any hybrid or virtual classrooms that you um, teach. By the way, I should introduce, this is one of the tools. It's in action right now. Mentimeter. We do have an enterprise license for this tool. Uh, if you do like it, you can request an uh, enterprise license from our academic technology team uh, at here at AU. But if you want to join me in this activity, I encourage you to go to menti.com. You could just hit click a tab on a browser here, click menti.com, put in this code 79244546. As we're going along in this presentation, you can just react, you can heart, you can put a question mark and that let me know, okay, there's some questions here. Maybe I pause during this presentation to see if what those questions are. We have a thumbs up, like you agree with that reaction. You also have a heart, uh, a cat heart sort of reaction for those cat lovers like me and Hannah and Rachel, we love our cats. As well as a thumbs down for something, maybe I'm saying something controversial, I don't know. Um, and, and you want a thumbs down and maybe I need to slow my rolls there um, <laughs> on what I'm saying. 
So this is a very interactive tool and it is one of the tools we're, we're talking about and we're doing it in action. Thank you for the car, uh, cat um, reaction. It's one of my favorites. So and I'm gonna ask you some questions. There's gonna be a question here. So you are gonna have some interactive uh, polling uh, within Mentimeter, which is great because although Zoom has a polling feature, being able to have your presentation and have that polling be integrated into your presentation Let's be real. I just think it's a lot more seamless than the system that Zoom offers right now, where I would have to stop share my screen, pop up the poll, then show the results. You'll get to see results real time. I think it's a powerful component of Mentimeter as a tool that you could leverage for your presentations. Again, this is something that could be used in a face to face classroom, right? Allowing students to bring their digital devices and interact with you via those digital devices in the classroom. That being said, I did want to lay out, we're going to be doing some jumping around here uh, as far as a presentation is concerned. Uh, we want to show the tools. We want to show what we're using, what we're leveraging. What are these tools that can unleash creativity? Not just for you as the instructor, but ultimately your students, right? I think that's the most important component uh, that can really light that fire, right, of learning within them, within your particular subject matter. The first tool we're talking about, it's Mentimeter. We're in it, you can react to it. We just saw that cat reaction previously. It's a wonderful tool, it's a wonderful place to um, place your presentations. But I also gotta say, why I like Mentimeter, just a personal pitch of mine here, is that it allows me to really think of presentations in much more succinct pres like um, methods, right? So I, I really think about just limiting my words right? So it's not, you're not digesting too much content, putting just an image and allowing myself to elaborate on that image. I think it's great practice as a whole to build presentations in Mentimeter because it really uh, kind of forces your hand to limit how much content you're putting on a particular slide, right? And, and then you're not overwhelming the student, right? No cognitive or overload. So that's just a personal pitch of why, like, it's not only interactive. I think it, it, it helps kind of control how much content we're putting in on each slide. Um, the second one, we're gonna do a nice activity is Miro, all right? This is a brainstorming tool that we have uh, used, leveraged in our team. It's great, we're gonna showcase it later to, uh, uh, you know, later in the presentation. We're gonna talk about Yellow Dig. This is a community building tool. Again, I'm gonna elaborate on these a, a little bit more and my colleague Rachel is also gonna elaborate on them as well. Um, Kaltura. A lot of you might be familiar with Kaltura already. It's a built-in system. Whenever you hit record to the cloud on your Zoom sessions, like this one, for instance, it's going to be recorded into Kaltura, right? So that's our main video mechanism. There's a lot of nifty tricks that are uh, involved with Kaltura that you might not have heard of. Play pause it. This is a tool that our team has leveraged heavily for engaging videos, adding questions to videos. So that's our sort of pathway, our journey today. These are the tools we're gonna talk about uh, throughout this session. Hopefully we'll, we'll get through it all. It's a lot of tools. And again, this is an overview. We do plan on holding much more uh, specific deep dive webinars in the future as a team that will offer you a, a better glimpse of the entire catalog of possibilities within each individual tool. This is just a tease, really inspire you, get to understand what's the lay of the land, what's available for you here at AU. And so without further ado, let's talk about tools. Let's talk about what you wish you had. Now, these questions, you could go ahead and um, if you're already on menti.com and clicked on that code, you can actually answer this um, question here. Each one of the tools I presented in the previous slide takes care of this element. It's an engagement tool. Some of these tools are community building. Some of these tools like Mentimeter give you enhanced collaborative presentations, those capabilities. One of these tools, Miro, which we'll talk uh, afterwards is a brainstorming tool. So feel free to answer, I wish I had access to blank for teaching my courses. Community building, this is such a, I'm glad someone responded there. I think this is such a important element for us at AU. It's almost our brand, right? We wanna make sure that we're we're, we're building a community with our students um, here. Oh, this is wonderful. So oh my gosh, it's Eric. <laughs> oh, there we go. Um, all right, so I'm just gonna give it a minute or two. 
to let folks answer. Again, menti.com using that code 79244546. Ooh, we got enhanced collaborative presentations. Mentimeter, again, we do have an enterprise license to this. So if this is something of your liking using Mentimeter, I highly encourage you to use it. Uh, it, it really is just a great way to create that interaction, right? Sim put polls within the presentation instead of ever having to go outside of it. But community building is a big component. And I really do think collectively, right, Rachel, I think a lot of these tools can cover community building as well um, beyond just the specific yellow dig capabilities, right? They all help. So just great. Thank you all for participating. I'm going to go ahead and move on if that's okay. Again, there's going to be some more questions and I see there's some folks here. So I, next question, I, I want to, uh, the next couple of questions, I want to see some more participation, um, but community building is a huge component, right? It's a big part of our brand. So I, I'm really uh, glad to see that. Ooh, it keeps going up, Rachel. It keeps going up, community building. So when we talk about technology, right? And I know we're literally at the precipice, right? At the advent of this uh, artificial intelligence movement. And we all feel a certain way. Not that I'm trying to bring that topic up in this presentation, but we all feel a certain way about technology and change, right? And I'm not immune from that. Rachel's not immune from that either. We all feel a certain way about technology but I feel like it's important to level set ourselves, right? And kind of look at the full context of the history of classroom technology. And I like showing this image, right? To level set before we take deep, you know, deeper understanding for some of these technological tools that we've had some innovations in the past that now we just take for granted, right? And the chalkboard, right? This blackboard is a perfect example as a technological innovation of the past, right? In a classroom, allowing the instructor to write out their thoughts or ideas so students can take notes, can keep track. This was an innovation. This was a piece of technology. And so within that same vein, I think it's important to view these next tools. Some of them might serve you well, and some of them might need to be served in a certain capacity, right? They work for certain instances. So I just think it's important to level set before we get deeper into this conversation together, this journey together, to just frame ourselves that way, right? That this technology movement is not anything new. We belong to a long line of different innovations that have occurred in the classroom. Right. And so sometimes it's worthy of embracing some tools. Sometimes it doesn't make sense, but embracing them nonetheless to experiment, right? To see if it works for your particular capacity. I think in that spirit, it is so important. So the chalkboard. Okay. So now I'm going to talk a little bit about some of the specific tools. Mentimeter. This is what we're using right now allowing to pull your students in the middle of a presentation can really go a long way. Again, keeping presentations succinct, right? Keeping what needs to be focused on, focused on, whatever your subject matter is. I think this is a very powerful tool. I use it for almost every presentation I give, conference presentations as well, so that I don't have to worry. And I can react in real time to the numbers, the questions, the polling that's happening in front of me, right? And it allows me to engage with you, you to, uh, it, you to engage with me. It really is a wonderful back and forth technology. Something we have available for you, maybe you've heard of it, maybe you've used it, but if you haven't, highly encourage you to experiment with it. You could even just it, download it for free. There are very limited, like, um, I guess, limitations, I should say. There's there's not that many limitations to the free licenses. Uh, you really can't work, you can't collaborate with other folks. So that's a difference between like the free version or the enterprise version. So there is that element. If you wanted your students to, let's say, co-create or collaborate on a presentation, that might be difficult. You might need the enterprise license for that. But overall, if you're just using it, like I'm using it for just this presentation, you can create multiple presentations on Mentimeter for free with a free account. So it is a very robust tool. You could use all the question sets. You're limited on theming, but oftentimes that's not really important element. You don't want to theme uh, presentations or slides too much because then it could detract from the content. So again, this is something we're using right now in real time. Thank you for the reaction. 
showcasing Mentimeter. One of the tools that we're going to showcase, and we're going to have a fun little exercise and share this all with you here, is a virtual brainstorming tool that we have leveraged heavily as an internal team. And we'd be remiss if we didn't share it with you. Again, this is a tool that we don't necessarily have an enterprise license for, but its free version is very robust. Its limitation on free is only that you can have three boards active at a time. But you imagine, right? You can have one board for one class, another board for another class throughout that semester, and then just switch it up as the, you know, as the semester changes and go on into a new uh, board or new slide deck, for instance. So that is the limitation with the free version, but it is very robust. It really helps brainstorming exercises. If you if you were thinking or ideating whether you're you know uh, uh, you know one of the STEM faculty members or math faculty members, just thinking through right on how you can brainstorm different ideas, different concepts with your students uh, in real time. So not only you add content within these boards, but your students can add content to these boards. And what I'm really excited is Rachel's going to showcase some real examples that we have done as a team, uh, specifically talking about artificial intelligence and how our team has navigated that. And again, using Miro as that brainstorming mechanism for us to showcase that. I think what's so beautiful about this tool is we all do brainstorming sessions, right? But then it's it's almost like a living document, right? So now you have a living document to showcase that thought process. And it's very powerful, very good. Um, and I want to sort of pause here and I see the question, but I won't pause here because I think it's important to state how important your opinions and your thoughts are in the tools that we adopt and the tools that we pay for. And I think part of the goal in this session is to showcase what we have, uh, have purchased, but also showcase some things that we haven't fully embraced that maybe if you all are interested as faculty members to embrace more fully, we can be those advocates to you know, push it down to the finish line uh, and, and purchase it on a more extensive level. So, Cynthia. Oh, Luis, thank you. Um, this looks so cool. And I have, so I was sort of asking um, you know, about how we can use these in, in an in-person classroom. And I have, like my students do concept mapping um, and kind of treasure hunt, like finding how one program, I'm a public health professor, so how one program influences another. And I love this because it gets them away from sitting around a piece of paper. But did you did you say that only like three students could work on the same one? Is that the limitation without the larger license? Great question, Cynthia. No, there's no limitation on participants. There's only limitations on the active boards, right? So let's say you have a board created for your students in one class. You could only do a board, uh, have two other boards active, if that makes sense. But this, the space itself, so within one board, students can work in different areas on that board for a class. I see. But in theory, each student group could have their own board and there wouldn't be a limitation. If they sign up for Miro on their own, in that scenario, they could each then have their own three boards to, to okay. present, work on, collaborate on. But as far as, and you're going to see it here when we do the activity, but there's no limit to how many people can be inter, like uh, interacting with said board, if that gotcha. makes sense. Thank you. Thank you so much, Luis. Oh, my pleasure, Cynthia. Thank you for asking questions. And this is a casual conversation. It's morning. It's morning time. We are just a few days away from the start of the semester. So if any of you have a question you want us to pause, happy to have that. Of course, we are going to dedicate some time at the end, but I do want this to be a casual conversation. So thank you, Cynthia. And please, if there's any other questions as they come along, feel free to raise your hand and we'll 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 pause when appropriate. I like some whoever's using that uh, cat emoji. I don't know if it's you, Hannah. My money's on you. All right. Yellow dig. So this is huge because a majority of you, about five or six of you in this audience have selected community building. You want to make sure you're building community. And again, I'm, I'm a lot of these tools because of our work in online learning are definitely built to enhance the online learning experience but they don't only live in that bucket. So I'm gonna approach this particular tool, if that's all right with all of you, through the face-to-face -face lens. And that's that Yellow Dig can be a powerful tool to engage your students prior and after class lectures, right? To really 
uh, create, like bring in modern events, bring in casual conversations into your respective subject matter. I, none of you teach a subject that isn't actually impacting the world right now. There, there is no such thing as a subject that's not impacting, that's not moving, that's not elevating, that's not evolving. There's current stuff that's happening that sometimes our textbooks, right, can't keep up with. Yellow Dick can be that great tool to facilitate those conversations. We're going to delve deeper. We're going to showcase this tool. But as far as community building, and really that's what it's called, right, with Yellow Dig itself, it's about us as instructors stepping away, right, being that guide on the side and allowing students to be central in their own learning, right? We structure it, we theme it on a particular subject, but ultimately allowing students the freedom to interact with that subject, right, to really lead the charge and what they're curious about within that particular subject matter. So Yellow Dig is just a wonderful tool that, again, this, this we do have an enterprise level for. It's built in Canvas. So if you do use a Canvas shell for your face-to-face -face course or hybrid course, highly encourage you to check out Yellow Dig. It's available as a plugin. You'll see it at, on the navigation tool as something available for you. Highly encourage you to explore it or ask your instructional designer uh, to give you access, give you a brief overview. Again, we're going to have a late, uh, some trainings later this week that take a deeper dive on this particular tool, but Yellow Dig, wonderful, wonderful community building tool. And with that, I'm gonna pass it to my colleague, Rachel, who's gonna talk about the last two tools we'll showcase today on this journey. So uh, we're going to showcase Cultura and, and Play Posit, and they kind of go hand in hand. They're very similar to each other. Um, Cultura is what I like, it's a little bit more user-friendly, especially if you're on the you're not as experienced using technology within your course. Um, so it's usually, I always frame it as like Kultura is like a, the safer safer option, whereas PlayPosit offers a little bit more dynamic features um, where you might want to collaborate with an instructional designer um, within your school. Um, Kultura focuses on mostly hosting um, any media content. You can do live uh, lecture captures, um, it has uh, audio, automatic captioning and transcription. Um, there are some collaboration tools. It does integrate with uh, Canvas, so we do get some of the analytics. Um, there's interactive video options with annotations, and um, there's some light video editing and assessment tools built into Kultura. The, and on the... Uh, use case, um, because Cynthia, you were kind of asking about, you know, ways of using this within your face-to-face um, -face class versus using it in a strictly online class. A lot of these tools can be used both in face-to-face -face and in um, online instruction. It just depends. It really then just boils down to you know, do you want it to be like a flipped classroom model where you're focusing on building a lot of your lectures and hosting them in Kultura or PlayPosit, um, creating playlists and, and the like, um, and then uh, doing more engaging like case studies and scenario-based learning and active learning opportunities within your, your live sessions, whether they're through Zoom or through um, the live uh, session in the face-to-face -face classroom. Um, or you're teaching in a hybrid class and you've got some students online and you've got some students present, physically present. Um, some of these tools like Menti, um, Mentimeter and Miro really allow for that hybrid and the co collaboration as well as, you know, continuing the collaboration pre and post class. Um, so going into PlayPosit, the big difference between Kultura and PlayPosit is that PlayPosit allows for easier use of uh, playlists so and integration and um, incorporating things like YouTube, TED Talks, other platforms, not just strictly um, host the content that's hosted in Kultura. Um, you, so you can kind of like chunk it all out and do it for a whole entire module, um, add in additional, like add in PDFs, add in um, the assessment questions, there's a little bit more robust assessment questions available in PlayPosit as opposed to Kultura. Um, and then there's collaborative learning options, live broadcast and synchronous learning options. Um, you're basically building a content repository 
there's integration with Canvas. So you can either do it as just like a plugin on the on the page where you know you don't really need uh, the students to have a graded assignment. You just need them to kind of engage with the content or you can do it through the LTI tool. Um, and one of the big things that PlayPosit has started to roll out is a branch scenario option. So let's say a student is working through something, um, they get assessed on it in PlayPosit and they got something wrong, you can actually pinpoint and send them back to a specific part of a video um, so that they can kind of like relearn and um, re reprocess the information in order to proceed. And we've had we've had folks use them. I think the the big thing that um, for PlayPosit in terms of just generally like um, the different use cases that we've we've seen um, are really just creating the playlist and creating the interactive elements within a course. Um, I would definitely recommend that if you have uh, some very complex assignments, you could do a playlist for your course on like an FAQ kind of style. Um, so as far as our team as thought partners and what we can help you with, um, we really can focus on a variety of things from curriculum mapping and alignment, um, whether that is at the course level or at the program level. If you were, um, for the program level, you'd be working with uh, Stephanie Schott and, and Luis here um, to kind of coordinate out our, our teams and get you the appropriate support from a program level. At a course level, um, you'd be working with your instructional designers to do that and making sure that we're mapping it. Um, I know in terms of like the School of Education, we have several accreditors that we have to um, create reports for. So making sure that we're we're documenting and tracking that in the back end of a, in the back end of our development is really important and saves a lot of time down the road. Um, content development and organization, talking through with your instructional designer on like the flow and logistics of your class and like kind of what you want to incorporate, what needs to go in a live session what versus what should be in an asynchronous option um, and kind of talking through those different elements and creating an appropriate assessment design for your course, whether it's in a face-to-face -face course or an online course, and really talking about the different elements, what works and what doesn't work. Um, we're great at technology integration, um, accessibility and inclusivity, active learning strategies, and um, just working on like the professional development side. If you have questions, we're happy to be the first line of defense. Uh, we will also redirect you where appropriate to either uh, CTRL, uh, academic technology, and in some cases, uh, academic the Office of Academic Integrity and Assessments. Um, and we're happy to also provide peer review and feedback. Um, I've ha I have to do that tomorrow for a faculty member who is new and just wants somebody to double check their online course. Um, so our team is always happy to help. Um, if you need our contact information, it is available. Let me put the link in the chat. Um, so you can reach out to any of us by your school. Um, again, I support the School of Education and uh, the City Teaching Alliance, which is also under School of Education. Um, but if you ever like aren't sure who you have to reach out to, you can always reach out to Louise or Stephanie. So that being said, um, we would like to know what additions you are most excited about either to integrate into your course or to just learn about today and get some more information. And if you, there we go. So if you go to menti.com and then type in the code, Got another minute. Three have answered thus far. We've got a uh, yellow dig, Miro, and Mentimeter. Mentimeter strong ahead. Strong lead for Mentimeter. Give it one more second here. 
I know it's hard. I feel like Rachel, it's hard to ask this question because I feel like we we've loosely touched. So Mentimeter is what we're actively seeing. So I imagine that is the one you're most excited about because you're seeing it. Um, but we'll delve into these other tools as well. All right. And don't, yeah. Or I think that speaks for itself. Don't panic. We have you covered. We're always, all of us are always happy to help. Um, we try to be very responsive. Um, all of our count, our, we switch to, uh, you can book me. Um, so we do make our calendars and time available to faculty members, especially around um, the start of the semester and leading up to the semester. But feel free to reach out to any of us throughout the semester, especially like if you're developing a spring course, please reach to a, reach out to us as early in the fall as possible, because that gives us the most amount of time to kind of talk through these things and make in, intelligent choices. Um, especially if like you're moving from a face-to-face -face course and you want to move it online and it requires a lot of media development. We do have a media development uh, team. And so their schedule, just working with them and getting everybody scheduled, uh, you know, the more time we have, the better. But we have we have done, you know, you know, you reach out to us two weeks before and it's really just become how can we best support you to be successful in launching your course um, and be effective for both you and your student. Awesome. All right. Well, we did promise that we'd get into Miro. So without further ado, bear with me one moment here. I'm gonna copy the board link. And so Cynthia, in real time, you're gonna see kind of how it works a little bit. So this hopefully. Awesome, thank you. So I'm adding a link into the chat. If you click on that link, you should be able to join this board. And it seems uh, someone already joining here. Just a quick tutorial. And I feel like it is loading here, but there are templates available. Some are, again, enterprise level, but a lot of them are also for free. There's also um, text you can add, shapes like arrows or circles. And these threads can connect one to the other. Then there's, uh, of course, you could write, you could comment. But my favorite is the, where are you? Sticky notes, especially the design thinking, thinking project-wise. So we've got a question for you. What are some shows that you are currently watching or you consider binge-worthy? It's summertime. I'm sure we've all binged something recently. I am going to... Actually, I'm spelling it wrong. Cobra Kai. Little Karate Kid action. That has been a great show. Supernatural, binge-worthy, Broad City, Hulu. Oh, sorry, I'm moving it. Oh, let me just leave it there. Go ahead and put, oh, Outlander. I I think I think I was like we were like four seasons into Out Outlander. It just it's it can be heavy. Some of those episodes can be heavy. So, um, and obviously this is a silly silly question that exercise, but I think it really shows the functionality, right? You you're getting able to see. So feel free to. Um, add in shapes. I'm glad someone added its shapes. Uh, it's just to explore this tool and you'll have access to it after the fact. Okay. So if you want to explore a little bit more, see its functionality, feel free to use it that way. Game of Thrones and the House of Dragons. So um, I am rewatching Game of Thrones again for the second time uh, as like my workout, like a, you know, running video watch on the treadmill to match the House of Dragons. I it's so good. It's so good. I I am a huge Paul Giamatti fan. So I've definitely just put two in here, uh Billions and uh 30 Coins. He's in the second season of 30 Coins. It's like a, a Spanish telenovela style. Um so I just two, 30 coins was just unexpectedly just a really good show. Paul, Paul is a, a national treasure, that's for sure. 
I loved him in John Adams. Ooh, deadlock. Some of these I haven't I haven't seen 30 coins. Evil. I don't know if that's a scary one. I don't know if that's like a horror one. And, and you know, our team really enjoys using this tool as a brainstorming exercise. Again, not only is it a living document, but it's fun to just comment. Sometimes I put music in the background. Um, I know uh, Bruce was mentioning he likes uh, playing music to begin class. I think that's such a good idea to do it if you don't do it already. But while folks are adding materials here, it might be great to put some like lo-fi or some classical music to, uh, to help with the ideation phase. So this is Miro, all right? This is Miro, but we wanted to show, right, Rachel? So I'm gonna let you, um, I'm gonna go ahead and navigate here and let you talk about some of the, uh, one of the use cases that we've had with Miro. Again, you can keep adding it to it. I might, uh, you know, Rachel and I might keep this to see what our next shows are gonna be. So feel free to add as we continue the presentation and explore this, this tool. Go ahead, Rachel. Um, so I'm just, uh, responding to Amanda, um, we do not have a university license, but you do get up to three active boards on the free license. Um, so a lot of us, our team, our team has um, has a licensed version. Um, so we we do leverage it quite a bit. Um, but if this is something that you were going to use in your uh, class and it was really effective. Um, please feel free to share that with uh, your school instructional designer with Luis, and we can write a write a justification or a business case um, to kind of push it and work with academic technology in order to get it into our toolkit. Very similar to um, Mentimeter and some of the other tools that we've uh, integrated over the years. Um, so you get again, you get three free boards, um, three active boards, and then you can kind of retire them. Um, some of them, you can also download them and uh, launch them as a PDF. Um, so our team, we, we can go ahead and open up the uh, AI brainstorm. Um, so our team, this came out of a meeting with Academic Integrity, um, came in and did a present. We kind of had a conversation and a presentation with them um, to go through how uh, AI and academic integrity were kind of being um, affected and evaluated at the university level. Um, we, Luis had created this uh, Miro board and we, you know, were putting sticky notes in and kind of having a huge discussion uh, around the AI implications in terms of academic technology and how students were using it and what the ethical concerns are. Um, so we decided as a team that we were going to meet weekly um, for about 30 minutes um, just to kind of go through some of the tools that we were all looking at because everybody was kind of like looking and reviewing and even using and leveraging other um, AI tools within our toolkit for course development for um, and just experimenting um, so that we could make recommendations to faculty. Um, so here it was kind of a way for us to organize it and have it be that living document because not since we were meeting weekly, um, we weren't, uh, not everybody could make it every single week. So we wanted to have a place where we could put the, I, the tools that we were reviewing, um, things that we were discussing and the resources and linking out to them. Um, and then we also mapped out some of like our goals and deliverables and, um, and what we kind of wanted to come from this like brainstorm, like think tank. Um, and that way, because Luis had created, has created the board, we also have that communication up to, up to our managers and to our upper echelon of leadership. Um, we also were working on like how these different tools map to the business goals within the university, which is down below that. Um, and just kind of seeing like the, the different types of templates that we could incorporate into uh, the Miro board. Um, these were all just templates that Miro already has created and I just kind of like poked around through them um, and then customized them based um, on what our needs were as a team. Um, that way we could kind of have a visual board and be able to collaborate um, 
For example, I found on LinkedIn uh, this really great chat GPT prompt that goes through different ways of formulating your prompt that you would put into uh, chat GPT in order to generate um, these different types of scenarios and the link um, and then linked it for LinkedIn um, just to offer credit in case any of us wanted to cite it within our uh, faculty online communities. Um, so it just kind of gave us a way of like breaking down what all we were um, reviewing, where it was in terms of the in the review process or the pipeline and kind of what we've all kind of like gone through um, and evaluated. Great, and this can, yeah, and, so and so circling back to Cynthia's point, like, as you said, like the concept map, um, this is really like, it can be used either in an online classroom or it can be used in a live face-to-face um, -face class. If your students are accustomed to bringing in their laptops, tablets, um, even, even your cell phone, you can get on and, and add tools. Um, there's, uh, Miro has an app for, they have an app for that. Everything is an app. Um, so there are ways of leveraging it. Uh, it's very similar to Padlet and other online collaborative tools, but we just have found that this has worked really well for our team and our needs. Yeah, and I de definitely think there's an educational um, aspect that it could also be really impactful within a classroom. And this isn't just ideas. We actually did for a use case. Again, faculty, you have the power, your voice. Speak to us. Let us know what you need. Let us know what your needs are, even if it's beyond the tools we have right now. Um, because 11 Labs, that's listed here as one of the research AI tools, we did purchase for a use case. And so, you know, because of two faculty voices. And so your voice does matter. It helps us build a proposal, build a case. Um, to then purchase it even during these budget constraint times, right? Because your voice does matter. So just this this turned into something, right? I think this is a beautiful showcase because it definitely turned into something, Rachel. Thank you. All right, so we're moving right along. There is limited time, so I apologize if I am going to start moving a little faster, but I do want to make sure that uh, we get through all the content and we get through all the showcasing. Okay, so let me just lower this. Yellow Dig. Yellow Dig is that community building tool, right? It is embedded into Canvas. Again, thinking of the face-to-face -face context, the traditional learning context, right? What you put into the classroom discussion content-wise before the class session could really make that class session go a lot further. So Yellow Dig has some built-in features like motivation. It's a point-based system. So students do earn points as they react, as they post, as they comment. So there is that uh, in, in, extrinsic motivation, right, of, of points. They see their points uh, increasing as they post. Course relevance, I mentioned this, but we have to choose textbooks sometimes. There's just no way around it or, or books. But there are things happening in the outside world and the pace of change that are relevant to your re respective subject matter. Yellow Dig could be that medium in which you discuss those subjects that are sort of in the moment, right? That are happening within your field. I also think Yellow Dig is, has been a powerful tool for us for instructor presence. Again, you are the most important component uh, for a successful learning experience. Being in Yellow Dig allows for casual conversations, for more personal conversations, and you being in the front and center of that, as opposed to maybe the traditional discussion boards where it's more like mini essays, right? But actual conversation uh, can really help facilitate and build that community. A theme from some of these tools that you'll see, especially Yellow Dig and PlayPosit, is that they're data informed. There is data analytics behind it that you would have access to if you were to put it in your classroom to see how your students are doing overall, right? So what does it look like? And I am showcasing one from uh, one of our health nutrition faculties, amazing person, Evan Reister, uh, major shout out to him. He has been an early adopter of Yellow Dig and he essentially leveraged Yellow Dig to completely replace any discussion boards, any element of that, and use Yellow Dig as the main facilitation of conversations within his classroom. So as you can see, and we're gonna definitely go into the tool in Canvas, uh, it, it has some features that, and this is in the instructor view, but the central part is the community. It's called a community. 
and it's a thread that you can navigate. The newest posts go straight to the top. It's very much like social media. The discussion board built into Canvas is not like social media, right? Whereas this is welcoming and very much built in a very user-friendly capacity. People can react, people can post videos, people can po uh, post audio very seamlessly. And then you as the instructor have different elements here as far as keeping track of your members, data settings, uh, as well as uh, for students, they would see these elements, these top four of community, any drafts they make, bookmarks, things they want to bookmark, and then their participation as an individual. So I did mention this. It is a gamified element. There's a gamified element to Yellow Dig that is worth noting. There's certain times to certain times that you could set for students to earn a certain amount of points, right? So you don't want students to just all, you know, and this happens with discussion boards, right? Where they wait till the last minute to post and people aren't really responding, right? You want to encourage that time window, right? Uh, so that they're they're posting continuously. And one post is not enough, right? They have to comment, they have to react, all these things can add up. But then sometimes conversations or posts can have a popularity contest, right? And so it's good to have accolades and that's what is pictured here. So you as the instructor can add some extra points for those posts that you find really relevant, right? That or, a hit, or especially if you're trying to structure the conversation go, to go more this way, you can be like, this is where I want you to be. And so you do have the ability to grant extra points to very relevant, very specific, very well-written posts or commentary, right? So you do have the power to sort of plus, like plus one, uh, you know, your respective students and their posts. And just because Rachel did cover some of our brainstorming on artificial intelligence, I did want to just highlight how powerful this tool can be to sort of reframe the conversation around artificial intelligence, right? We know some, uh, some students can use it to write essays, not very good ones, but they might, right? And I feel like we need to help them understand that sometimes if we build if we build tools that help them understand concepts through casual conversations, those casual conversations can lead to more robust methodical papers, right? Or thought processes, right? And so being able to start conversations or thematically, uh, you know, introduce content and introduce it through a casual conversation where AI can't be generated, like you can't generate AI to have a casual conversation necessarily, right? Uh, so being able to use Yellow Dig can really feed into more appropriate, well-created papers because essentially they're creating, they're ideating the content in Yellow Dig. They're thinking about it, they're talking about it. And that can lead to a more robust final project, final paper, and really can help alleviate some of that temptation, right, to use artificial intelligence. It could also be a great mechanism to talk about it and how are people using it. And also help our students understand that this is this is a tool to, that can help you maybe work along. It can work alongside you, but you don't want to use it to replace your thoughts altogether, right? And I feel like there's a, a wonderful coaching moment, and Yellow Dig can facilitate some of those conversations. So um, just wanted to uh, kind of talk about that a little bit. So I did want to share some research that Evan Reister did create, did ask his students on replacing the discussion board with Yellow Dig. And as you can see, uh, as far as from when students were just using the discussion board to connect with their classmates, as opposed to Yellow Dig, Yellow Dig had much higher increase in, in favorable ratings, right? For agreeing and strongly agreeing that it helped them connect with classmates. One of the cool elements was stories, little anecdotes that uh, Evan wrote is for health nutrition, they were starting to post recipes, right? And starting to talk about uh, healthy, nutritious recipes that they were creating, and that some of these communities, even after the class ended, were still active. So again, just a wonderful tool to connect. And here's some research to sort of back that up. Yes, Cynthia. Um, this is awesome. And Evan is in my department, so I'm going to make sure I give him a shout out. So um, this is awesome. Um, um, for this survey, was that for online students or in-person students? Do you know? Yes, I do. That's a great question, Cynthia. This was for online students. Thank you. That's an important caveat. Uh, these were for online students in the uh, health nutrition program. 
So in the master's degree, there's a graduate level. Got it. I, I still think it could be useful in person. It's almost like having a Slack, you know, group or something. Um, anyway, awesome. Thank you. No, you right, right train of thinking, right train of thinking. Yes, Rachel. And and Cynthia, to your point, in a face-to-face -face class, if you're teaching a class that has like multiple different um, kinds of students, whether they live on campus, off campus, you've got a mixture of like freshmen all the way through, th through seniors, if it's a general education course, they might not all be in the same social group. So this adds in that social element where they're able to engage with each other on the class content, where they might not be engaging um, necessarily outside of class because they might not be in the same social groups. Yeah, I, I mostly teach upper level people in, in the major, but I was to your point, Rachel, how great would it be if core classes use this? You know, complex problems, I meant, yeah. Yeah, huge use case there. Um, again, just showing some more data points and thank you, Cynthia, for your question. And thank you for, um, making us make sure to share this caveat that these are online graduate student responses, but enjoyment, joy in the classroom. You all are experts in your field and you found joy within your subject matter. There's a passion that you have for your subject matter and making sure that students find that passion, I think is, is why we do what we do here in education. And so, uh, joy is an important element that we don't talk about. Uh, again, this helped uh, students enjoy some of those conversations a little bit more. Not, not incre <clears throat> incredible, but you can see the numbers increasing there. And then, of course, you know, it's so great to match quantitative data with some qualitative data. And here is just some uh, commentary, some extra comments from the students. I, I really feel more connected with my classmates. There is no stress of due dates. That's a key component. Like you, you're, you're, you're wanting to post, right? The interactive element, it made you feel a lot more connected and that sense of community. So all just wonderful comments from those students. So there are some elements I want to be transparent here that are not ideal. Again, we want to be partnered with you. So if you are interested in this tool, reach out to your instructional designer, feel free to reach out to me. But the layout can sometimes not be user-friendly right? It, it can be a little bit difficult for the instructor to get their bearings. So we have created a template that I'm about to showcase here with some instructions that we really think can alleviate some of those um, startup concerns. It can be a little tricky to, to figure out at first, uh, especially with the point structure of like what's happening here, the point errors. So, so we really do want to be partner with you here when you're, when you're setting it up. And then here's a key point, class can get a little bit less responsive when the points have been reached. So almost counter to discussion boards where everyone's rushing to the end, what we're finding is a lot of students end up collecting those points early on in the week and having those conversations early on in the week that towards the end of the earning cycle, it could sort of uh, die down a little bit. Potentially best for, and it's a good thing that a lot of our classes are are, are quaint, are, are, are well-situated, but smaller classes can really go a long way of helping students get to know each other. This isn't exclusive to smaller classes. These are Evan's thoughts on some um, best for use cases for Yellow Dig. I must say that Yellow Dig has been used for much wider audiences, much bigger classrooms, and been successful. But overall, for, for how easy it is to leverage and keep track of the post, definitely smaller amount of students can go, uh, you know, could go a long way in getting, for you getting to know your students. Creativity, it's much more on creativity as opposed to sort of long format on facts or things like that. It's about being creative and thinking through on particular subject matters. Could be a great facilitator for projects. And um, if you think or you feel like your class is, it can improve its in-class participation, again, a great introductory tool to bring to your table. And so with that, and I apologize, I'm moving fast, but I, I mean, we really could spend a long time together here, um, really taking a deeper dive on these tools. So this is a course, and let me go ahead and get this course so that you can click on it uh, and navigate, because it is open enrollment. So I am going to share this in the chat. There you go. Uh, and here we just have on the homepage some basic information with the intro video, 
as well as how to reach out for support for Yellow Dig. Yellow Dig has built in their own knowledge based system. So if this is something of interest, they have really robust training as well as a whole Canvas course that you could take. But we really wanted this course to be a template where you can share some resources or copy these resources into your course if you are planning to use this. So what's great is that Yellow Dig, once you activate it into your classroom, right, um, through navigation, and by navigation, I mean when you go to settings on Canvas, you go to navigation, Yellow Dig is going to be one of the tools you can find here, okay? But it can also be added as an assignment, as an element within a module, right? So students can access Yellow Dig here or within the module pages within Canvas. And if I click on the page here, I do want to illustrate that we do have this template language, right, with tips and tricks, as well as uh, some, some boilerplate language that you can fill out as far as your topics, your specific topics that you want students to talk about. And when they're ready to get started, they click on the link there, and it navigates them into the community. And so... We don't have time, but you do have access to this community if you sign up and register for that course so you can check it out. You can hit reactions here. And this is just showing the different features. Happenings are a tag. Photosynthesis is a tag. There's different tags you can create. So, so you keep track of the subjects that students are posting on, right? Um, again, very easy to add media, different forms. There is very robust data. And again, I have to be light here on what I'm sharing. This is very much uh, 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 not everything it does here, but uh, we are going to take a deeper dive. We're going to share some workshops that we're going to have in the future fully dedicated to Yellow Dig as well as Play Posit. But essentially, this is the look and feel of it, right? And that's the sort of uh, process, right, that a student would take to access this particular tool. Um, so I did want to pause there because I want to give you enough time. We've got 15 minutes left, Rachel. I didn't give you enough time to cover Kaltura Play Posit, but uh, I'm going to go ahead and pause there. Stop sharing and let you take it away. Okay. All right. Um, so we are right. There are several workshops coming up. Um, so I'm going to keep this mostly at a high level, um, just so that I'm not overwhelming anybody. Um, and as always, please reach out to your instructional designer. We're always happy to help talk through and brainstorm how you could leverage these tools within your classroom. Um, so at a high level, some of the use cases for Kultura, um, you know, and the same goes for PlayPosit. Uh, you can add a flipped classroom. There's different student assignments that you can incorporate. Um, getting them to actually record video presentations and submit them as part of an assignment. Um, guest lectures. Um, one of the things that is really great about leveraging Kultura, um, and the reason I'm choosing to, to cover Kultura first is because that's mostly where you would want to put any video content that you do create before using it within PlayPosit. Um, so in Kaltura, if you're having a guest lecture and you teach an online course, or say your guest lecture can't uh, physically attend because they're in California and we're on the East Coast, um, you can bring them in on Zoom um, and record that either synchronously or asynchronously and add it into your live class, post it on Canvas um, pretty seamlessly. Um, because if you're recording it on Zoom, our Zoom license has a 30-day limit but once it um, processes in Zoom, it processes and connects it to your Kaltura, your MediaSpace account within uh, AU. Um, so it will always live there and once it's deleted out of your Zoom account. Um, so if you're, you are doing a hybrid course or an online course, or even if you um, have to like skip your live your face-to-face live -face class, but you don't want to lose that instructional time, Kaltura really lets you like just record record either in Zoom or record in a live lecture capture um, and process it and post it into your Canvas class. And you can either create a um, asynchronous assignment to go to go with it. I'll actually um, show you one that uh, my one faculty member created, and then we put it into Kaltura and added in it into PlayPosit to add in some assessments. Um, you can have peer review, and there Kaltura allows for. Um, captioning and transcripts. Um, 
you can also go in and be able to update the captions if they aren't uh, perfect. Um, but it does have a pretty good accuracy rate. Um, so I, I do say that um, it is a pretty good tool in terms of that. Um, for our Kaltura knowledge base, um, let me just pop this in the chat real quick. Um, so we have a plethora of resources that academic technology has put together um, and added into our, our AU knowledge base. Um, so if you have any, like, really just want to know how to do, like, one specific thing, this is a really good place to start. Um, and I will also add in, let me stop sharing a sec. Well, actually, I have my, have my notes here. Um, Academic Technology will actually be running a Kaltura workshop on, uh, let me have it, I have it, uh, September 13th at 1130. Um, I also strongly encourage anybody to sign up for any of the other uh, Canvas related uh, workshops that Academic Technology is running. They're all virtual through, um, through Zoom um, and their team you know, does a fantastic job at supporting our faculty and students. Um, so please feel free to go and, and really leverage them um, because they are a fantastic team. And again, in uh, PlayPosit, we've got the, like the flipped classroom uh, options. We also have a form formative assessment option. The quizzing features in PlayPosit are vastly superior to Kaltura. Um, and then like you can also do some case study simulations going back to those branch scenarios, um, allowing for peer feedback, the accessibility, and then there's also a synchronous component that is available. Um, and our team is running a uh, another deep dive on PlayPosit on Wednesday, August 21st um, at 9.30 um, a.m. Eastern time. Um, so please feel free when, when that email goes out um, to sign up and get registered if you are interested in kind of seeing how you could use this within your course. Um, let me actually stop sharing and pop over to my other window. And Rachel, I just want to add, I did share the the links to those registration for our deeper dive workshops on PlayPosit and YellowDig. Thank you. That there. Um, so in terms of Kaltura and, and PlayPosit, we'll go through a few ways that you can access and use these tools um, because not you're not always going to be going in through Canvas to get to these tools. I, I personally find it a little bit easier to work within the tool and then go to Canvas. Um, some it really is you know person specific on how they prefer to navigate these. My per, my personal preference is to add any of my content within Kaltura and then switch over to Canvas. Um, so to get to Media Space, um, you would just go to this link, and once you're logged in, um, you have the options to add new content. You can do media upload. If you need to add in a YouTube, the Kaltura live capture, if you just want to do a, a quick, fast lecture, um, or creating a video quiz um, are kind of your different options. And they're really seamless. Um, I'll show you what the media upload looks like. So you would just drag and drop uh, a video file here. And like we saw on the last page, once it uploads, you can also add in um, these tags. You can create a playlist. Um, you can share it with your colleagues as a collaboration, share it with um, your instructional designer. Um, so that way we can collaborate, add tags, add descriptions, um, update titles. Um, and this makes it really easy once you get into your Canvas page to be able to add so I just have a Canvas page here and going in and it's this little button on the WYSIWYG. Um, so in our text editor, I'm just gonna click that. 
And once it's processed, we'll see it here. And so if I wanna add this into this page, I would just click embed because it's already processed. And then save and publish or save. And it adds it directly into the page. If I wanted to, I could add lead in text. text. Um, we have these integrated into a lot of our um, module overview pages in order for faculty to have kind of a module overview video and introduce the topics or do a course introduction video. And then on the flip side, oh, on the flip side here. So the example that I was giving earlier, I had a faculty member who um, had to take one of her, lec her online lectures. She wanted to add it into the classroom, but make sure that the students actually watched it and took the assessment questions. So we built a quick playlist. I had to break it up into two because she wanted them to stop, like stop after her one lecture and watch a YouTube video. But what ended up happening when she recorded her, her online presentation is that the YouTube video didn't change. So rather than re-record the entire lecture, um, I just cut it into two parts and then we put it into a play posit playlist and added it, added in the YouTube video into the playlist and just chunked it out and added in some uh, knowledge check questions at the end of the videos, um, just for her, the, her to get some assessment data and get those analytics um, and then incorporated it into um, the, the online class. And so you can do this either, whether you're doing a flipped classroom model in your face-to-face -face course, or if you're doing a flipped classroom model in uh, your uh, online class, or you can just have it be like, you know, we can't have class this week or think about like Thanksgiving, like the Thanksgiving week. Um, if you like are missing a lecture, but you don't wanna lose uh, that time with your students, you can also do like an asynchronous option and integrate that to kind of keep everything moving and flowing. Um, so the way that you as a faculty member would be able to add in the play posit, there's two ways um, to do it. And so in the Canvas page, you would go to the plug feature and it gives you all these different options. Uh, you would click the play posit button And you can enter play deposit. If you have any bulbs that you've already built, you can add them here. Uh, you can add in your playlist um, if you've already built a playlist or you can build it right within this editor. Um, and this would just embed it on the page. They would be able to engage it, engage with the content. You would get very limited data in terms of like who is watching, who is watching, who has done the activities. Um, just because it's a static page. If you wanted more uh, details, then we would go about it as creating it as an assignment. Um, so let's just pop in real quick. So if we wanted to create it as an assignment, we would go new assignment. And go down here, you can put in your assignment instructions and then um, and then down here for the submission type, we would cho choose external tool. Find and just scroll down. And this is partially why I like working within the tool itself, because when you come in to uh, do the play posit uh, deep link, it will give you those same options. That's probably everybody trying to work on it. 
that's not that's not great when you're trying to demo it. <laughs> um, but typically, you would be able to integrate it. Uh, one of the things that I I did for one of my other courses um, was integrating and making a playlist, adding in. Uh, you know, uh, instructions and be able to add this in as an assignment. Um, so that way we could get the information passed back um, and the points passed back to the grade book from uh, PlayPosit into uh, Kaltura, or not Kaltura, into Canvas. Uh, so let me pop it into preview. It was in preview mode. So when a student goes in, this is really like what they end up seeing it once they pop it into full screen. Otherwise, it's just an iframe in, within the Canvas course. Um, but again, we'll be doing a deeper dive on PlayPosit next week. Um, and they will also, they're also delivering uh, some webinars coming up because they know that every university across, um, across has to uh, be able to uh, support their faculty. So they run uh, some fantastic webinars. If anybody's interested, we can also provide that information. Yeah. Um, Thank you, Rachel. So that's like the high level. It was fast. It was fast. Um, Katrine, I think you have a slide. I do want to, we got two minutes for questions here, but I'm going to pop in here some other upcoming workshop events for Yellow Dig and as well as Play Posit. So feel free to ask any questions if you have them now. Um, email us. This is, I'm also, I guess I should put my email here. It's not in the worksheet. Let me also share the play, play pause it. And yes, please, uh, Thank you, Rachel. That's our information by by college. And also, we we all have um, and faculty communities set up for each school. So please feel free to reach out to your instructional designer because there is school specific information um, along with our contact information within those courses, um, as Canvas and other ed tech tools, uh, pedagogy. Um, there's a lot of resources uh, that we linked out to whether they're from CTRL or stuff that we've built in-house. And yes, before you leave, please take a moment to fill out that survey, QR code. Hopefully this was informative, maybe a little too informative, a little too long, or uh, not long enough. Maybe not long enough. Um, it's a lot of stuff. It's a lot of stuff to cover, but hopefully we inspired your, your thought process on what's, what's, what, what are some possibilities this fall and beyond. Thanks, Hannah. Appreciate you. Sorry for the cat appearance, everyone. That was Hugo. Sorry, everybody. Everybody needs a cat. Everyone needs a cat. And Han Hannah, if you want to talk more oh. yellow, please feel free to email me. I know you're you're teaching this fall, so I'm happy to help you and support you. I just registered for next Friday. Is it? Yeah. Yeah. And you can always throw some time on my calendar. So. Mm hmm yeah, I was going to ask if if nobody else has questions. Um, like, since you work a lot with the education students, do they they appreciate these kind of things or they already have experience in other courses with them? Um, some of the other courses do lever do leverage these tools. Um, 